it is rather difficult to understand what was the object of all these maneuvers. They were so much trouble thrown away. The first consul very soon forgot his quarrel with Madame de Souza and never alluded to again in her presence. During the first six months that followed the Peace of Amiens, the first consul led an almost idle life at La Malmaison, dreaming of the improvements which he could introduce to the various departments of his government of the encouragements which might be given to agriculture, to industries, of the various works which might be carried out for the improvement and embellishment of Paris and the departments which he proposed to visit in turn, and finally, of the arts of peace. During this pause in the midst of a life so busy and so fully occupied, he projected a league of the maritime powers for driving the Barbary people from the coast of Africa, their lands to be afterwards used for planting sugar, coffee, cotton, and produce, which had to be drawn from remote colonies. If the plan of this league could have been carried through, it would have diverted him from the expedition intended for the reconquest of the island of San Domingo. The idea had been proposed by Joseph Bonaparte. It was highly approved of by the first consul. Joseph Bonaparte was anxious that the four powers who had signed the Amiens Treaty should take part in this league. It was indeed shameful that Europe should tolerate, oppose, opposite to her, a nest of pirates who levied blackmail on her with insolence and who each year carried off into the cruelest slavery the prisoners they had captured on sea or on land, pirates to whom... Nothing was sacred, and who rejected our arts and our civilization? It was useless to hope to bring them to accept the relations and the conventions by which international rights are established between civilized states. The loss of Egypt enhanced the value of the resources which a colonization of the Barbary states so conveniently close at hand and a naturalization of the produce of the islands of America would have placed in the hands of the various powers." The plan of a conquest of this vast region was carefully examined in the cabinet of the Minister of Marine. A first step toward carrying it into effect was indeed made by a mission with which the Spanish government entrusted Badia, a clever and adventurous traveler. The moniteur of 14th Thermidor year 10 reported that two Spanish savants charged with exploration of these countries had passed through Paris. This plan of an expedition was perhaps one of the reasons of the rupture of the Peace of Eminence and the renewal of hostilities which ensued prevented the First Consul from carrying it out. The great events which were played out on the stage of Europe obliged him to renounce his scheme for the time being. But he did not lose sight of a plan which, from the time of the renewal of hostilities with England, was one of the chief subjects of his thoughts. On April 18, 1808, Napoleon being then at the Chateau de Marac, near Bayonne, whither he had been summoned by affairs in Spain, wrote the following letter to the Minister of Marine. Monsieur de Cray, think over the Algiers expedition, both as a military and a naval campaign. If France could get a foot down on this part of the coast of Africa, England would have cause to reflect. Is there any port on this coast where a squadron of ships would be under cover from a superior force? What are the ports by which the army once landed could be revictualled? How many ports could the enemy blockade simultaneously? In Egypt, there was, after all, only the port of Alexandria. Rosetta was a very dangerous harbor. Still, it was counted. I think that there are a dozen here. How many frigates, brigs, and store ships could they hold? Could Admiral Gentilhomme's squadron enter the port of Algiers and be sheltered against a superior force? At what time of the year is the air good and pest no longer to be feared? I imagine that it is in October. After having studied the Algiers expedition, give your careful attention to the Tunis campaign. Write a confidential letter about it to Contillon, who, before coming to Paris, could get the necessary information. His inquiries should extend as far as Iran and should bear on the land, as well as the maritime aspects of the proposed expedition. What we must find out about the inlet is whether there are roads and water. 
I calculate that 20,000 men will be necessary for this expedition. You will understand that the enemy is to be led to believe that Sicily is the object of this expedition and that they will be nicely foiled when instead it proves to be Algiers. You need not answer me before a month. In the meanwhile, get your information so that when you do answer me, there shall be no buts, no ifs, and no becauses. Send one of your engineers, a man who knows how to hold his tongue, on a break. Let him talk with Monsieur Tanville, but be sure to select a man of tact and of talent. This engineer should have some military as well as some naval knowledge. He must walk about both on the inside and on the outside of the fortifications. And as soon as he gets back home, write down what he has noticed so that he can bring us back plain facts and not merely his own dreams. Consult with Sanson as to the best man to choose. You will be able to find exact information in the archives of the Foreign Office and of the Ministry of War. Have these archives, as well as your own, looked through. Information about these countries has always been asked for in France. Several Frenchmen who had exercised civil or diplomatic functions in the Algiers Regency, heads of French establishments in that country, engineers and naval officers who had discharged special duties there, were all consulted. Monsieur Jean Bon Saint Andre, who had been commissioner of the government at Algiers under the Directoire, handed a detailed memorandum in which all the questions put to him were answered to the Minister of Marine. Napoleon's attention was also taken up with the scheme for reorganizing the academies. The term academy was suppressed. The institute was divided into four sections. The first was termed class of physical and mathematical sciences. The second styled class of the French language and literature. Answer to the French academy formerly so called. The third was the class of ancient history and literature. And the fourth, that of the fine arts. The class of moral and political sciences created by the law of the year four was suppressed and merged in that of the belles lettres. It seemed superfluous to the first consul. He supported his opinion on this matter with reasons which I do not think it necessary to examine. His principal motive was not, as has been said, his dislike for philosophy. He has often expressed himself on this matter, but he was then convinced that the discussion of political matters had still, at that time, its disadvantages. The eight or nine months which followed the Peace of Amiens were divided between La Malmaison and saint Cloud, which the first consul went to inhabit in the spring of that year. This palace, although not vast, afforded a beautiful and comfortable abode well suited to Napoleon's habits and requirements and provided with magnificent gardens. His workroom was very large, and its walls were literally covered with books from floor to the ceiling. He had himself designed his writing table, which was in the shape of a base. Numerous papers were spread out on its wings. His usual Place was on a settee covered with green taffeta, which stood near the mantelpiece, on which were two fine bronze busts of Scipio and of Hannibal. Behind the settee, in a corner, was my writing table. His study was reached through a bedroom which he did not occupy. His apartment was on the floor above and communicated with this room by means of a private staircase. It consisted of three plainly furnished rooms. The only ornament of the bedroom on the ground floor, which looked out onto the garden, was an antique bust of Caesar, which stood on the mantelpiece. Beyond the first consul's workroom was a small drawing room where he used to receive the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who, by reason of the nature of the business of his department, had no reports to address to the council state. This drawing room was also used for private audiences. It was decorated with a fine portrait of Charles VII. The first consul was dissatisfied that this portrait has also been selected and had it replaced by a portrait of Gustavus Adolphus for whom he had a particular esteem. Paisiello came to Paris in the spring of this year, summoned by the first consul, whose attention it was to entrust him with the direction of the opera and of the conservatory of music. Napoleon admired this celebrated composer's talents. He used to be so delighted with Nina's pastoral, Gia il sol, Cicilla dietro alla montagna, 
that he said he could listen to it with pleasure every evening. Paciello was then over 60. He had hesitated about coming to Paris, fearing to expose his gray hairs to the criticisms of his rivals and dreading to compromise his great musical reputation. He was received with great honor by Napoleon and with deference by the artists. He refused to accept any other post than that of chapel master and restricted himself to the composition of masses and motets. The only opera which he composed in Paris was Proserpina. It was only moderately successful, a slight reverse, which somewhat grieved him. After residing three years in France, his desire to see his country again and to take his wife home to a milder climate induced him to return to Italy. He went home with a pension from the emperor and loaded with presents. Monsieur Litzer, whose talents he admired, succeeded him as Chippette. Chapel master Paisiello used to send Napoleon a sacred composition each year for the anniversary of the Emperor's fete. He also paraphrased the Stapat Matter of Pergolesi, which was performed in the Imperial Chapel. I have preserved many letters from this excellent man, which he wrote in sending his compositions and in which he expressed his gratitude to and admiration for the Emperor. I am convinced that these professions allowance made for Italian emphasis were quite sincere. Canova was sent for to Paris at about the same time. He came to St. Cloud to execute the bust of Napoleon and devoted himself to this piece of work for several days with a veritable predilection. The first consul used to lunch in the large drawing room which led into his apartments so that the celebrated sculptor might work more at his ease during this meal. This drawing room was afterwards ornamented with portraits of the Bonaparte family. When Napoleon became emperor, he used to receive all the members of his family who happened to be in Paris at dinner every Sunday and spent the evening with them in his drawing room. A large balcony onto which this drawing room opened communicated between the private apartment of Napoleon and that of Josephine, afterwards occupied by Marie-Louise. I used sometimes to remain with Canova after the sittings and to occupy him into the gardens. He spoke bitterly of the statues he saw there and pointed out to me the decadence of good taste, which they proved. He regretted that the artists of the time of Louis XV, and especially Boucher, should have applied their great talents to works which he considered pitiful. A reproach of another kind might be leveled against Canova himself. He carried off the model of Napoleon's bust a model true to nature, and most noble in resemblance, and which on this account had been generally admired. I do not know why, renouncing this resemblance, which ought to be the first merit of a bust or a portrait, he made an idealized head. However grand a character he may have wished to bestow on his work, he could not hope to make a more heroic face than the original. It was after his bust at Canova executed the colossal statue of Napoleon, which he sent to Paris in 1811. This statue may be admired as a work of art, but the want of resemblance in the head and its nudity displeased the emperor. It was placed at the Louvre without having been previously exhibited. It was the same statue which either was bought by the Duke of Wellington or was given to him by the government in 1815. It was carried off to England as a trophy and placed in a spot very unworthy of it and in a way which does little honor to the delicacy of feeling of the victory. One of our sculptors, as remarkable for his great talents as for his natu national feeling, as he was returning from a walk in London, saw a number of people stopping before the partly open door of the mansion, the mansion of the Duke of Wellington. Prompted by curiosity to approach, his astonishment can be imagined in recognizing in the object which was attracting, attracting the eyes of the curious, Canova's beautiful statue of Napoleon placed at the foot of a staircase, and being used to hang clothes and hats on. I remember that one day the first consul brought back a quatrain on his return from Josephine's apartment where he had been spending an hour. He threw this poem on his writing table and said that it had been composed by Madame Fanny de Beauharnais. It was a play of words on the word Bonaparte, and the last line, which is all of it that I remember, ran as follows. La bonne part sera la nôtre. The better part will be ours. The first consul, whilst doing justice to the authoress's intentions, which he considered better than their execution, took pleasure in speaking of the good qualities of Madame de Mornay, Josephine's aunt. He praised the gentleness and the goodness of her character, even if he was then under the first 
impression of this lady's innocent flatteries. This impression was a lasting one as he never ceased his protection of her son and granddaughter. The son was appointed senator of 1804, the senatorship of Amiens being granted to him. When the emperor married the Archduchess Marie Louise, he placed him in her service as gentleman in waiting. In 1806, he married Stephanie de Beauharnais, the senator's daughter, born of a first marriage to Prince Charles, the grandson of the Duke of Baden, whom he succeeded in 1811. Some days later, Madame Bonaparte came and knocked at the door of the cabinet. She immediately entered, followed by the usher, who without a word placed a basket covered over with cloth in the center of the room and withdrew. Whilst Napoleon was waiting for the explanation of this enigma, Madame Bonaparte drew away the cloth which covered a basket. A little man, not more than 18 inches high, who was lying down in the basket, raised himself with difficulty, and leaning with his two hands on the handle of the basket, turned a pair of dark and shining but lusterless eyes upon us. The dwarf was dressed in complete Hussar uniform with the red shako vest and dolman regulation boots and was girt with a saber which kept entangling itself in its little legs. There was nothing monstrous about him except his extreme smallness. His limbs were well made, his features, if inert, were regular. Nevertheless, the ev evident insensibility of this misconception, whose life seemed merely mechanical and whose intelligence seemed destined never to develop, for he was said to be 17 years old. His stability, the pale and bilious color of his skin, and his weazened and sickly ensemble excited disgust. The sight of this poor disinherited creature, nature's cruel sport, placed face to face with a full-grown being in whom the same nature had been pleased to unite a majesty of features to a superiority of genius, would have offered a singular contrast to the eyes of an observer. The fine and impressionable organism of Napoleon, evidently suffered from so painful a sight, and without one word of comment, he prayed his wife to remove the dwarf from his eyes. The union of Piedmont to France took place in the month of September 1802. This occurrence gave rise to no recriminations. It had been expected for a long time. Piedmont, the throne of which remained untenanted after the retirement of the king to the island of Sardinia, was in pawn in the hands of France as a stepping stone either to serve as an indemnity or to be used in other diplomatic combinations. The fate of this country having been passed over in silence in the treaties of Amiens and Lunaville, and Russia not having asked for its restitution to the House of Savoy, its incorporation with the French territory was consummated by a senatus consultum, General Jourdain, who combined the functions of military governor of these provinces with those of general administrator, was replaced by General Menau. The first consul had certain prejudices against Jordan, which he afterwards discarded. When at St. Helena, he expressed his regret for having misunderstood him and spoke of him in terms which do honor to them both. Another event which occurred about a month later and which caused no more sensation was the union with France of the Duchies of Parma and Piacenza, brought about by the death of the sovereign of those states. By the Treaty of Luneville, Austria had lost Tuscany, which was given to the Infanta of Parma, who was married to a daughter of Charles IV, King of Spain. The French government had immediately put the Infanta in possession of his kingdom, and he had assumed the title of King of Arturia in exchange for the life crown with which the preponderating influence of the first consul had endowed this prince. The duchies of Parma and Piacenza had been ceded to France, but Napoleon had desired that the old duke should finish his days there in peace. 